Hello everyone. This is Mary here from Boom Learning. You also can see Andy and Jason from French with the Hobbs. Hello. Bonjour. Hola. Guten Tag. Welcome to all you language teachers out there. Thank you to Mary and Boom Learning for hosting this webinar. Today we want to look at tools for teaching world languages at a distance. So our webinar agenda will look like this. We'll explain who we are, um, give some goals for our webinar, and then we want to dive into resources where we can meet the core skills of our students via distance learning. So we have two resources to go along with reading and writing and two resources to go along with listening and speaking. We have some question and answer time and then how you can contact us afterwards. So first, I'm Jason. And I'm Andy. Uh, and together we are French with the Hobbes. Um, we're two French teachers who met in France while working on our master's degrees. Uh, and from them, we've been able to team up and uh, share resources and ideas and inspire each other. Uh, most of our experience is at the high school level, though we do have a little bit of middle and um, college level experience as well. And from here, Andy is going to take over and explain uh, the rest of the time. Our goals for this webinar are to provide you with some helpful resources that would be applicable to any language and to any age learner. Maybe you find something that's new that you're willing to experiment and try, or maybe it's something that you're already using, but you can put a different twist on it to, to make it your own with your teaching. We also want to take a second just to encourage you as we all navigate what distance learning looks like with um, us as teachers and with our students. So um, just remember to give yourself um, grace and your students grace as you keep realistic expectations. And don't forget that we have this amazing opportunity as language teachers to still make our language fun and rewarding and enriching. Even if we're not in the classroom with our students, we can still do it. Um, on this distance learning road that we're on. We talked about the core skills of language learning. The reading and the writing are pretty easy to implement when it comes to distance learning with our students. The listening and speaking is a little bit trickier, so that's where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time. The um, two resources that I want to share with you um, that deal with reading and writing and distance learning are your Boom Learning cards and a resource called Cami. So let's go into Boom Learning first. I have a card set up here. Um, if you're not familiar with Boom Learning task cards, they are very interactive and engaging for students. Students really enjoy them. They provide instant feedback for students. Students can go at their own pace and there's different cards that you can create that incorporate reading or writing or even listening and we'll get to the listening part later. When it comes to writing with languages, we often need accents. And so I'm gonna point that out to you now. I have this card here. I made a deck on practicing prepositions in, for beginning French students. And there is a word here that needs an accent. So um, for students to write in answers, you need to have the fill in the blank tab and you bring it over to, to where it, wherever it is you want on the card, you'll double tap and then here is where you are going to submit the answer. Um, if you do not have a number pad key on your computer, you can just type it into a different document, copy it, and then um, paste it into this box. Click Submit. And then you need to choose what, whichever um, font you're going to use, whatever size you want, the color, and click Apply. Then you X out of that. Now you have the answer, but you do not have the accents yet. So you need to go to details. And right here you have, you have grades and you have your subject. And that's where you want to click. Scroll down to world languages. On the on-screen keyboard, you have choices of Spanish, German, and French. So I will click French. I will X out of that. Now you notice that nothing has changed here and that is because you're in the edit mode. But once you go to the preview mode and this is what your students will be seeing, you see the box and then you see the cursor is here. And now I can type in um, my word. And this is the letter that I want my accent, accent grave. And then you click submit. Okay. 
Now, if you um, want, you can also not just make it one word, you could make an expression or a sentence. If you want a sentence, just make sure that your box is large enough for your students. And also, you can, um, we'll take out that answer. Maybe for a sentence, they're, they're going to type um, Sandrine prend du lait. Okay, you submit that. But maybe for this particular answer, there's more than one possible answer. So you need to submit all the possible answers into the, this area here and submit that. And then again, you choose your font, your size, your color. And again, make your, your box large enough so that now when students um, preview or look at this card, they have a large box to create a sentence still with their accents available to them there. Okay. The other resource for reading and writing that I want to show you is something called Kami. This is um, essentially digital pen and paper that students can use and you as well in your teaching. It's really easy to set up. It's free. You can sync it with your Google Drive account. If you do not have that, you can um, start with your email and it is um, accessible that way as well. I synced it to my Google Drive, so I will show you that way. On our website, we have some instructions on how to set this up and how to get started. Um, right now, I'm just going to assume you already have an account so I can show you what it looks like. So here I have Lecture au Café. And once I open my document, I can annotate with Cami. And you're going to see that my document will open, but it will have these tools over here on the left hand, hand side. Now, this is the free version, and in my opinion, the tools are substantial for what is provided. The yellow locks are what would be available once you upgrade, if you choose to do that. So I have this reading strategy here that I would ask students um, to maybe point out the different food vocabulary, the drinks, the desserts. Maybe I'd, I'd ask some questions and want them to actually write on and respond on this sheet of paper, this digital sheet of paper. So I think there's three ways that you could use Cami. You could use it here as um, practicing reading. You could give students an actual homework assignment, a worksheet, a practice um, sheet of some sort where students would have to write in their answers. Or you could use it um, as notes and give students a document that is a copy of what you're teaching and then they can mark up all over the paper and keep it for themselves. So let's show you how to do some of these markups. So you have here, you can choose between a text highlighter, a box highlighter, strike through, underline, and there's lots of colors. So maybe I want to start with a text highlighter and we'll make it purple. And then I'm going to drag, or to drag my cursor across un cafe and it becomes highlighted. Do the same thing if I choose underline. I hold down and drag de la quiche and it becomes underlined. If I want students to write, or maybe they're choosing to take notes on this document, whoops, I will choose the text box, and then I double click, make my text box as large as I want, and you type in your answers here. Um, if you choose to sync this with your Google Drive, you can come here, the students can save their document, and they can actually um, submit it back to you as a completed worksheet or a completed um, homework assignment, whatever it is that you're choosing to have your students do. So this resource, like I said, um, is a, a great way to practice reading and writing in, in a couple different forms. Now let's move into um, our resources for listening and speaking via distance learning. Um, how do we get our students to listen in the target language and how do we get them to actually speak the language um, via distance learning? And so our two resources are Boom Learning and Flipgrid. Let's go into Boom Learning first. We're going back into these really great digital flashcards that um, are a fantastic way for students to listen to the target language. But first, let me just show you how to actually upload your audio into Boom Cards. 
to have to use the sound feature right here, you do have to have an ultimate membership. Boom is providing that free of charge through June 2020. So take advantage of that while it's, it lasts so that you can experiment and try, try this um, feature. So in order to have um, a, an audio, you need to create one. And on your computer, you can use your computer software, you could use Audacity, you could use GarageBand, whatever is um, most convenient or easy for you. We choose Audacity. All we do here is we open up Audacity, we click the record button, it records what we say, and we stop. And then if it needs editing, the noise reduction or amplified, we just go into the effects and play around here. We are not professionals when it comes to this. We just simply want our students to listen to the target language and we do the best we can. After that, we make sure that we export it as MP3. We save it, webinar example, save it and it'll save into our sound recordings on the computer. And then now we're back into Boom. So now I'm gonna drag the sound megaphone and I'm going to upload my sound, and it should be um, in my sound recordings. Webinar example. And now I have that is uploaded. The green triangle will let you listen to the audio before you upload it to your card, or you can just click on this and it will um, be put onto your card. I'm not gonna use the webinar example right now. I'm going to use Lavash, so I'm gonna click on that. And you can make this large or small. And when you click um, preview, because you cannot listen to it right here in edit mode, but if you go to preview and you click. Lavash. And then Lavash is, is here in the audio. So that would be how to incorporate audio just to get it onto your cards. So we have come up with um, some ideas to share with you on how to incorporate listening practice into your boom cards for your learners. But first I want to just kind of point out that this list is not um, exhaustive. There's so many different ways that you can um, create these cards and, and modify them for your students. I do want to point out one thing though, as we create these cards, we have kept in mind the idea of lower order thinking that's asking students just simply to identify and recall some of their vocabulary. But then we progress to harder cards that will ask students to possibly categorize or to evaluate um, in different ways. Elementary students up to college can, can need to practice with lower order thinking and they need to build up to the higher order thinking so that they can really grasp the language. So let's go back into the boom cards and I will help walk you through some ideas of how to incorporate listening. So this simply right here would be listening to a vocab word. So I want to drag over my sound. I'll choose lavash again. And I would be asking students to click the picture it re represents. So to click the picture, you need this little tab right here, multi-pix, and you will see that it has, it gives you by default four um, pictures, a multiple choice with four pictures. You can do four, you can do less, you can do more. Um, my audio is lavash, so I'm going to choose, first of all, um, I'll put in lavash. I double click, I'm gonna choose my other farm animals, um, and then we'll get our goat here. Okay, now my images are not transparent, um, and so what I would need to do is, um, if, if you want to make this a little prettier, um, clicking here, click the background um, image, nope, sorry, do the color and make that white apply. So now when students go to this card, they will hear Lavash. They click on and it's correct. Okay, so the second card, X out of that, is um, making your um, megaphone a picture. So after I drag my megaphone over and I'm going to choose Lavash again, so my audio will say that, but what I want for this is that this image is actually a cow. And the way I'm going to do that is with background image, 
and I go into my images and I click my little cow there. I can make it larger or smaller. And I just put in multiple choice box here. I'll just show you real quick, multiple choice. I brought it over. I only wanted um, two, I didn't want four. And I just simply change correct to re and this to no. And you can resize it, you can make it um, larger, smaller, you can change the, um, the, the background colors, the button colors, you can change all of that. The answer is true, that when students click on this cow, they will hear lavash, and that is right. So they would click this. So I just see that my that box is outlined in green for it to be correct. And so now I will give the instructions so that students know that they click on the cow. Lavash. They hear it, and they know that it, go, it is correct. And so we would hit re. Okay. Um, the next card here, um, I, I, I dragged over my sound, and again, I just brought over multiple choice. I get rid of two boxes, so I have two things to choose from, because what I would be asking students to do is to listen to a sentence. And based on the sentence, they would need to evaluate between two different topics. Maybe I was talking um, about, we're working on grammar, and so was the sentence that they heard in the present tense or the future tense? Maybe it's a beginning student who's just learning between formal and informal. What they heard, was it formal? If so, click that particular button. Uh, you could do um, things that are logical or illogical. And so, um, the, the format is the same with the audio and the, the two choices here. Um, making it a little harder would be listening to a conversation and choosing if it's a logical conversation or not a logical conversation. Now, some of you are thinking, but I don't have somebody else to record with. That's totally fine. Um, you can do a couple different things. You can, um, we as language teachers, I think, can be really animated and change our voices in order to get across what we're trying to teach, um, especially without using English with them. So maybe um, person A would have a higher voice and person B would have a lower voice. Or maybe person A speaks, there's a long pause, and person B speaks. Remember that these cards that you're making are for your students and their learning. You do not have to submit these for the whole world to, to use. And so um, keep that in mind as you're creating things for your students to hear the target language. So again, all I did, I brought over the sound, I um, would upload the conversation that I had recorded, and the students need to choose logique, illogique. Um, this one is, um, again, bringing the sound over. This time, the student might be listening to a question, and then the answers to the questions are your options here. I'm just using four multiple choice. So if the question was, como tu t'appelles? They would look at the different answers and choose the one that would appropriately answer that question. Um, this particular one, I would need to make sure that one is green, and this one, is the red. You could switch it, and this answer could be je m'appelle Belle, and they would need to choose the question that is associated with that audio. This one um, is listening to a description. So click the image it best represents. Um, I dragged over the multi picks. I only want two choices, so I erased two of the boxes. I chose um, this image of the paper and pencil, and I'm gonna click here, and I'm gonna choose my image that I already have um, as a calculator here. Because on your unit with um, classroom objects and um, subjects, perhaps you're going to describe a class that you're in, and based on the script description, the student would choose Am I in math class or is that more applicable to English class? This one is one of my most favorite. It's a little trickier to put together, but I really like it because students are listening to a large portion of audio and they have to sequence what the story is talking about. So again, I'm gonna keep with the idea of school subjects and classroom objects. 
So all I did, I just took the image tab over here and I dragged, and of course, look what I say. I'm gonna make it just a little smaller. Whoops, let's size that down a little bit. Okay, so you can see here, um, you can always size it and make it a, a little bit more presentable. Um, but for the sake of time, you know that you have three images here that are um, dealing with classrooms, subjects, and objects. And so I want the students to sequence and tell me what did they hear described first. So that's where they're going to be writing. Fill in the blank. I'm going to drag that over, double tap, and perhaps um, this. English class they will hear as the third um, description. I submit that. I'm going to again choose my font and my font size and my color. Just play around with it, see what you like, what works. And then I will size. Now I can duplicate this over here. I can make another box, duplicate it again, and then I have a third text box. I just want to go in and change my answer. So from three, I'm gonna make that, that'll be the first one that, the first class that students will hear in the audio. And this would be the second that they hear. I want all of those boxes to be correct because I want them to be able to put an answer in each one. Um, you remember from before that we don't need accents here, but we already, um, have our on-screen keyboard as French, so our accents are still going to automatically show up. So that when you see here the images um, with the text box, so based on the description, um, what did they hear first? Well, they, they heard math was described first, and then some things about French class, and then some things about English class. They type in the number and they submit. Moving on, um, this one, listening to a description and reading a sentence. So my idea here is that on a unit with family, for example, they would listen to a large description about a family, who the members of the family are, what their names and their interests are, what um, they might look like, and that description would be here. This text box here then would change to a sentence. Uh, let's just use la famille de chien. Oops. Okay, and you can make this larger, smaller. You can use all of the different sizes up here if you want to um, make this larger or you want it to be a different color, bold, how, whatever works for you and, and appeals to you. So the students would listen to the description. They would see this sentence, la famille de chien. Well, based on what they heard, is that sentence true or false, vrai or faux? And they would choose the correct button here. All I did here was just bring over the multiple choice and um, got it down to two boxes. Now what's great about this one is that you can use the same description for multiple cards and all you would do would do right here, clone the selected card. Now that same description is still uploaded in the audio, and now all I need to do is, is um, change my sentence. So instead of la famille de chien, I might talk about how the brother has brown hair, or maybe the sister likes to read, whatever you want to use here for, that, um, for this prompt. Okay, how do we incorporate listening and writing together? Well, again, still bringing our sound over. Um, here I, um, I brought my text box over and I double clicked and I put La Piscine in here. I just had all my fonts and my colors, my sizes, because my idea here is that students are going to be listening to a description of where somebody might be located. Maybe it's on your unit of places in town or it's describing school subjects. Maybe it's a room of a house. And so based on what the students are hearing, they now will need to um, type in where that person is. And if you need accents, those are still available to you. Submit. 
The last one here is much more open-ended, um, listening to a question, and then the students need to type the answer. Make the, make the box longer. The accents are still there. Remember what I said that this is more open-ended. So for this one, you, you will have to come up with um, potentially different answers, multiple answers of what a student might do. And remember, you just submit in this box and you can have multiple answers that students might say with this prompt. So like I said, these um, ideas are just to help get you started and maybe inspire you to think, oh, I haven't tried that. Let's see how, what we could do here. Get really creative and, um, and how you can use audio, especially while the Ultimate Membership is free and through June 2020 for, for teachers. Um, all of these different images are um, on our website, so we'll give that to you later. So if you want to go and think, oh yeah, what were they saying? Which card? And um, you can take a look at that to get inspired, or if you've forgotten and, and want to use one of those ideas, feel free, please use them. And I'd love to hear how they go, which ones really worked for your students and um, you had fun creating. So that's the listening part of um, Boom. However, Boom lacks speaking. To get your students speaking is not available in the Boom learning cards. And so we want our students speaking, right? How do we do that? Well, one way that we have found that is really fun is something called Flipgrid. And so we're gonna take a moment now and kind of walk you through how Flipgrid would work um, with your students in distance learning. So as we move into talking about speaking and how can we get our, our students speaking and um, you're probably familiar with Zoom and, and Google Hangouts and, and those are great ways to get together and see everybody and it's it's nice to be able to see everybody's face together. You can do some conversation, but it, those are pretty hard to get to some smaller group conversation and everyone being able to share. I mean, with so many students, it's not really possible to have a good conversation. So let's talk about Flipgrid where we can have more of an opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one kind of speaking. Now, it's not necessarily interactive fully like you would with a conversation face-to-face, -face, but it's a really fun way, and you can just think of it as an educational social media. Uh, so it's the way it works is you create your class, or what they would call grids, and then within the class, you can make different posts that they call topics, and the students are able to uh, make a video response. I did this recently with my upper-level students, where they were to go out and talk about what they see in nature uh, around, you know, with some of the vocabulary we had just seen from a Chupi book, if you're familiar with Chupi. Uh, so that's something I did recently, and the, the results were pretty fun. They had a good time with it. Yeah, it was fun to watch all of their different responses. So your French 3 class would have a grid, and your French 2 class would have a grid, and the French 3 kids only see their grid. They don't see the French 2 grid, and then you have your different topics. So once you share the link, this little rocket here, you would share the link with your students, and then they would receive it, and once they open it, they would see here the written um, explanation or directions, and then they would see their teacher as the first video and this is where you would model and give an example of what you're expecting and then um, they would then click this giant green circle here to record a response so Jason recorded a response to me and then submitted it and once I received it I um, watched his video and then you can see my circle here and that means that I responded to him so you would be able to see eventually your whole class here and then if um, different students responded to each other, you would be able to watch all of those different responses. And the nice thing is that it's close to whatever class you want it to be. So um, like I say, when I did my upper level uh, students, um, it was only those students who are in that class that I shared that with, and those are the only ones who could see it and, and post. Uh, also, for students who are kind of shy, they don't actually have to physically be on the video. Um, uh, the one that I did, the students were actually showing what they were seeing, and so they weren't physically uh, on the video, but you certainly heard their voice, and it was a way to, again, practice that speaking. Um, and they could also put stickers or emojis and things over their face if they wanted to or make it pixelated. There's different effects mm -hmm. they can have fun with. Um, hopefully that you know, the students will become um, uh, familiar enough with each other and comfortable enough that it wouldn't be too much of an issue, but it's something that 
you should think about it as well um, when using it. But uh, the students really seem to enjoy it. It's kind of like just an extension of how they typically do things anyway. Mm -hmm. I've even seen it work with elementary students and um, both the, the student and the parent really enjoyed it. It was just a fun way to connect with their classmates and be able to see um, and, and just kind of respond to one another. So that's Flipgrid. There are so many tutorials out there to help you get started, but like we said, it's, it's really easy and it's free. Uh, just to wrap it up, um, I just wanted to point out a couple other resources that would be available in our fund for language learning. Um, if you're not familiar with Quizlet or Kahoot, definitely check those out. They're really great resources, engaging and fun, and, and the students like them. Um, if you're um, synced with Google Drive, Google Forms is an, another resource that is um, multifunctional with, a, with assessments or activities. And lastly, just don't forget the power of music right here that um, music can be engaging and fun and even your high school students like listening to Les Contines every once in a while. So um, remember to use that as a resource as well. Lastly, if you're interested in finding um, some more information about, about some of these resources, please visit our, our website and um, you could get more information or contact us through the email that you would see on the website as well. So at this point, I want to thank Mary again for hosting um, and um, Boom Learning as well for providing this opportunity for this webinar. And we'll turn it over to Mary for some question and answer time. Um, question from Michelle. Do students need to individually sign up for Boom Cards to have an account? You have choices. So for a lot of our speech language pathologists, they're doing their work strictly as teletherapy. So if you were doing language remote tutoring, you could use the method they use. They add decks to their library, they open the deck from in preview mode from their library, then they use whichever platform they use for teletherapy. It might be Zoom, it might be Thera platform, uh, there are a variety. And then they screen share to the students. Some of those platforms permit, permit remote control by the student, others don't. So you have to spend some time playing with your platform to figure out what's possible. Um, and in those cases, they don't need, students don't need an account at all. And the, the tutor or therapist is there seeing the work as it happens. So there's no need for a student account. Others do uh, live instruction, either remotely, remote instruction, like I've just described, or through a video. And then they just want students to practice, but they don't need a record of that practice. So those teachers will assign using a concept called fast play. So again, you go to the library, you create a fast pin, you assign it to the student, and then they play that no data is recorded. Some teachers say, take a screenshot of the final screen. I just want proof you did the work, but they don't want to see individual progress. For teachers who are really closely monitoring skills development and are assigning homework, those students do need individual accounts. The teacher creates accounts. So students should not create the students should never click the I am a teacher <laughs> and create an account that way. Student accounts are created by teachers. So if you are using what we call sign in with Boom, you go add all the students to a classroom and then you distribute credentials to your students. We have FAQs about the ways you can do this. If you choose to allow students to sign in with Google, you need to first create a Google Classroom that has all your students. Then you, sorry about that, import that classroom to your um, Boom account. And that allows the students to then sign, click sign in with Google 
and use their Google authentication credentials to enter their Boom classroom. So there's two different ways you can get students into the classroom. Once they play a deck when they are authenticated, signed in, then you will have student reporting and that will show you overall performance and it will allow you to open up specific cards that they got wrong and see what wrong answer they chose. This can be helpful when you have, um, we have a few different reports. One report allows you to look at a deck as a whole so you can see concepts that your students aren't getting as a whole. This means you can identify where maybe your instruction wasn't fabulous. Um, but if most of the students are getting it, then you know it's just one particular student needs an intervention. So it's helpful on helping you tease out, was it me or was it the student? Um, Mary, maybe you can address the one um, by Shauna Penn, when there's a fill in the blank option for several blanks, when the students get one wrong. Do you want to take that one or do you want me? Will it I'll let you go ahead and take that one. So when you have multiple blanks in your boom cards and a student gets one correct, um, it will tell you the strike through of the answers that are incorrect and it will blank them out again and then students can go back and um, fill in the, the answers that they were incorrect and it will keep um, either striking them wrong if they got it incorrect or they will it'll get a, a green circle when they finally get all the correct answers. All right, we had a question about, can I elaborate on the webinar uh, for speech language pathologists? So if you go to our YouTube channel, um, so Boom Learning has a YouTube channel and we post all our webinars there. I do edit them first to do things like get rid of glitches, like when the video stopped in this one, that will be gone from the uh, posted recording. Um, so if you go there to find our webinars, there is an hour long webinar hosted by three speech language pathologists on their best practices for remote teletherapy. A lot of those principles also apply to remote teletutoring. So it is a good companion to this webinar. Mary, I'll take the question, does Flipgrid work with younger learners? Excellent. Yes. It does, it works really well. I have seen it work with um, first grade students where um, the teacher asked the students, what is your favorite book? And so the, the teacher would share the link with their parents and then it's through the parents that they would the open the flip grid. And then all of the different students would um, answer the, the question and have their little videos and then respond to one another. And it was actually one of the highlights of this little guy's day was seeing um, who responded on his grid and just seeing his, his classmates. So yes, it works really well with younger students. Like most things, there's a little bit of upfront learning and understanding, but it is pretty, once the students see how they, they have to click that green you know, circle with the ad and they, they know how to do it from there. And my daughter is now in third grade and they use Flipgrid pretty regularly. When she was in second, I mean, there was a little bit of drama about her head getting cut off and having to re-record her video because it didn't meet her high standards, but they get the hang of it very quickly. Mm -hmm. There is a question I'm gonna answer live about Google Classroom. Um, some kids just figure out how to click sign in with Google and enter their Google authentication and they're good to go. With remote learning in particular, we see a few different common pitfalls. One is Google isn't always thoughtful about how it signs in. So it might try to log in with the parent's Google account. If it's in a place where it thinks the parent is the one who should be logging in. So that can happen. Um, the parent might have created the login using the parent account thinking that's what they were supposed to do when really it was supposed to be a student school assigned account. If you've kind of torn your hair out over getting a Google authenticated student in, you can open up your classroom you created by importing with from Google, a Google classroom and you can add a username to the student and you can add a password and you can say you're no longer going to click 
sign in with Google, you are going to click sign in with Boom and you're going to use this username and this password. That is a workaround for families who just struggle with getting Google to work right. And there's a lot of complexity because they're using shared devices, they're using parental devices. So for some students, that's gonna be your best solution is just take the student who's having trouble, give them a username, give them a password and say, from here on out, you're gonna click sign with Boom. It will still feed all the data into that student record. So it'll be in that one place. Uh, Mary, I'll take the question about um, any suggestions for whole class activities that work well via Google Meets. Excellent. Um, mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, um, good games for a whole class would be um, scavenger hunts, um, trying asking the students to find something that is red and come back to the screen, something that they like to eat or um, something that is bumpy, for example. Um, another idea is a simple game of Simon Says, um, having them describe and show and share with their um, friends what a favorite toy is or a stuffed animal. That's what I have seen that, that works really well uh, with lower elementary. Mm -hmm. And some of that is spontaneous, some of it's prepared, such as, you know, if there's a toy that you want them to describe, they have to know that ahead of time, obviously, um, give them some time to prepare an idea. So. Um, yeah, those are some ideas that, that could work, especially at elementary level. Mm -hmm. Making it really personal. I'm going to go ahead and take the question on, are there resources for high school? I'm just going to do a quick share of my screen. Um, let's see if it'll, it's being a little silly in how it lets me do that right now. Oops. Keeps wanting me to set my settings instead of just share my screen. So give me a moment. Let's try this one more time. There we go. And share. So what you'll see on your screen is I've gone to the Boom Learning Store. I've clicked 9, 10, 11, 12, which in the United States is high school and I've clicked World Languages. I knew I had at least one French author who was doing high school materials. It looks like we now have more than one French author doing high school materials and um, some authors for Spanish. So there, is, there are materials for Spanish classrooms and for French classrooms in high school materials. And if you don't see your language there and you teach it at the high school, feel free to fill that gap, please. And I'm going to go ahead and stop that share. And we have something. Yeah, go ahead. Um, something to add with that, um, for instance, upper level classes, um, we made uh, a deck on object pronouns. Um, and, you know, it's, it was a very effective uh, deck. Um, the, the students were really engaged. Um, and that's a, that's a topic that's not always very exciting, but it was nice to have that feedback. And, you know, we could, you know, do different levels of types of questions. Uh, so that's the way that we used it in the upper level uh, classes. Um, there's a question about have you ever used boom cards for longer readings followed by comprehension questions. So the screen format can be a little challenging for reading an extended text and boom cards are kind of optimized to play on many devices. But one way you can achieve this is if you're a teacher creating the materials um, is offer the text on a PDF and then the comprehension questions are offered on the boom card. If you're a seller trying to sell this product, you would upload your PDF as a file, and then you would bundle it with your boom card and then sell it only as the bundle. So you would private publish the deck, private publish the file and bundle them together so the product is the bundle. Um, but certainly I, that's a great way to do it is have the comprehension questions in the boom cards for shorter passages you can include the short passage on the boom card but if you were looking for a full page passage that might get a little challenging to read and then you also have the problem of it gets hard to flip back and forth on a longer passage so it really depends on the complexity of the text what's the best choice there thoughts from andy and jason on that all right um 
on where do you get the pictures? Uh, from a variety. If you go to help, which you can find from inside the app, and click on our FAQs and search on uh, clip art, you'll see a long list of uh, um, clip artists who've said you can use clip art you buy from me on Boom Learning. There are many others who aren't listed there who permit their use. It's really up to you as the author to go secure the rights. Rights for privately publishing to your classroom will be different than rights for publishing to the store. It doesn't matter whether your price is actually um, more than zero or zero. Any publication in the store is a commercial use. So you do need to make sure you have appropriate licenses if you make it public. And there was a question about reports. Um, I'm not going to pull any up because I don't have my demo account pulled up and I don't want to expose any content inappropriately. Um, but we have a great video again in our um, uh, YouTube channel. We have a special tab called reports. So next to library, you'll see reports. That allows you to dig down. You select the class you want to look at, and then you go select all the decks you want to see, and you can see all your students there. You can also see the reports for an individual student by going to class, select the student, click report, and you'll see it there. The reports tab is accessible from the classroom also, and there also are deck-based reports, which are slightly different, which you can get from the library. So you should definitely explore, play around with those, spend some time with them, um, one of the things I like is I pull up a whole class report. I see what the range of performance is. And then if there's a student who's an outlier, I can click on the little circles and then I can see where their red areas are. I click those to find out what they're not getting. So it allows me to drill down on who is not uh, understanding the concept. Or I can also look at it. I, uh, there's also an element that shows me how fast they're answering. So sometimes I can look at it and I can say, oh, Okay, they've got it, they're, everything's green. And I can also say they're super fast. I'm like, well, this material was way too easy. I need to offer something harder. All right, are there any other questions for us today? And I apologize if I talk too fast during the q and I'm learning. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, students can log in with their Google IDs. For that to happen, you must import a Google Classroom. So first, you have to create a Google Classroom and then import it. There are two separate FAQs on this topic. There's kind of a simple step one, step two, step three at a high level. And there's a more detailed one in troubleshooting for those of you who've never set up a Google Classroom that walks you through that process. So one of those assumes you know how to set up the Google Classroom. Another actually walks through the process of creating a Google Classroom if you've never done that. Uh, oh, that I was gonna, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna quickly answer. Yes, if you buy the clip art from us, you can sell it in the store. <laughs> Um, I just remembered a question someone had put in the chat about Canvas integration. Um, and there's a number of things that can be integrated into Canvas. Um, the Flipgrid can. I don't think Boom specifically beyond, you know, sharing to, you know, but um, Cami, I haven't checked to see if Cami actually has, but I think you can because of the Google integration stuff. So I know Canvas, that's what um, my school uses. So there's a lot of integrations that, that can happen with that. And with Boom, we created the Hyperplay link and the Fast Play, so you can post those any place you can post a URL. You may need to have your technical team do some whitelisting so that it plays properly, but that could be universal. And we do have our whitelist information in the FAQ and available through the Help Center. Uh, yes, if you have more students than 200, you have to shoot us an email, and we will. We're currently offering additional students for free. There's normally a 50 cent student charge for that but right now we are just adding those to your accounts as part of the COVID-19 free fit so send me an email and we'll add the students please be patient we get a lot of emails right now it takes us a few more days than usual to get to them all right yes you can buy clip art from 
you don't actually buy it from us. You buy it from clip artists who have put it up there, um, which is why we use, people ask, why do we use points? The reason we use points is so that if you need a five point or five cent piece of clip art for that deck you're making, you can get it. There's no way with Visa charges that I can sell you something for five cents otherwise. Um, I must have... I'm not sure I understand your question, Shauna. Um, I'm not sure if it's a privacy question. I don't know if you can uh, write a little bit more there about what the issue is. Oh, good, I answered it, wonderful. Do we have any last questions? It looks like we've answered almost everyone. I haven't checked the chat to see if there's any that came in over there. Um, actually, right now, if you go to our homepage, wow.boomlearning.com, there's a big yellow sign that says COVID-19. And if you click that, um, our ultimate account is free through June 30th. And you also can get your additional students for free on top of that. So, but that you have to send us an email because that's always been something we have to do manually. Um, any device is a broad phrase. Uh, if you're using a Windows Vista machine and a really old version of Internet Explorer, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> we do have a technical specification with what works. Relatively modern browsers, and I do have to say Edge really has to be Chromium Edge. There's some quirks with pre-Chromium Edge. Internet Explorer, no. We don't support it at all. It's insecure. Microsoft gave up on it several years ago, and you should too. Um, but Chrome, Firefox, Edge, we do support. It plays on most Android and um, iPhones. There are some older versions of those devices. It won't play on in the app, but you can often get it to work using the browser. So if you can't get the app to work, try the device browser. Um, Um, so boom cards don't download. They only live in the cloud. They are served live as the student plays. So they are a live experience. They don't, um, they, they're not downloadable. They're like little mini programs that assemble themselves as they go. This is part of the reason we're able to have two students sitting next to each other in a classroom seeing, playing the exact same deck who started at the exact same time who are getting different cards. And even if they happen to see the same card at the same time, their answer choices will be in different places. This prevents people from relying on their buddy to demonstrate their learning and they have to do it themselves. Uh, and yes, iPad, we do uh, play on iPads. Um, for Boom, what's the best way to interact with touch to voices? Well, not over Zoom, that I can tell you. <laughs> um, so we've had, there's some limits to screen sharing and remote control and touch devices. So if you really want to do screen share and you need the student to show you their interactions, sadly, the universe we exist in now says use a mouse driven device. I know that's not super ideal for some students, but even Zoom with remote control, some some of the touch features work like multi-choice, um, but drag and drop doesn't always work reliably. So at least pick something that's multi-choice if you want to try to do remote interaction. For live interaction, um, touch devices, touch the screen and have fun. Um, and it should work as long as it's relatively modern and it meets our technical um, supported guide. All right, last chance. What do you want to know from Andy and Jason about remote teaching, live teaching? All right, I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much, Andy and Jason. This is wonderful content and super useful, even beyond um, you know, your non-primary language learning. Thank you, Mary, for this opportunity and hosting this webinar and Hopefully the, the conversation will continue with tools for teaching world languages. Excellent. And you can find um, French with the Hops, which is Andy and Jason at Boom Learning 
uh, along with many other people. So you can take a look there. And I saw the request for a webinar for math teachers. I'll see what we can do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.